welcome to Mondays with Marlo. Well, this guest today has really caused quite a stir with her fantastic book called Primates of Park Avenue. It's Wednesday Martin, who is on the New York Times bestseller list. You're number two on the bestseller list. That's amazing. Thank Congratulations. You. Thanks very much. That's hard to do. Well, that's a big accomplishment. I had, I had help. Thank you. <laughs> you had great subjects. <laughs> this is from Liz. Hi, Liz. What are Hi, you hearing Liz. from the women that you talk to for the book? Are you hearing from them now? Are they mad at you? Are they glad you revealed this? Where are they? Well, that's a question I get a lot. When I decided to write the book, I knew I cannot write this book without these women telling me because I landed on the Upper East Side. I didn't understand it. I knew these women were beautiful and glamorous. I uh -huh. knew that there was competition and pressure and mm -hmm. anxiety. And I turned to these women, some of them, and I said, I want to write a book about being an Upper East Side mother. Can you help me? And some of them wanted to participate, and some of them didn't. Well, that's the fair. ones who wanted to participate <laughs> told me amazing stories. They uh -huh. told me amazing stories about love and loss and uh, you know anxiety and motherhood. What the thing that really gets to me is these women get a bonus, a wife bonus at the end of the year if they've had a successful year as a wife and mother. Some of them do, some of them did. Well, that's startling. It was startling to me, but not the most startling thing. What is most interesting to me about it is that it sparked a conversation about real issues for women. I think that people were surprised to consider that you might be married to a wealthy, powerful man, but that that doesn't make you wealthy and powerful. It feels to me like a, an employee em, employer situation. It's definitely a power imbalance. Um, as you say, economic, one of the reasons I think the book caught on and sort of ignited was I think that women in this country are ready to have a discussion about economic dependency and about whether they really have choices. A right. lot of the women that I studied um, had children who were young, not in school yet full time. And because of this philosophy called intensive motherhood, which the sociologist Sharon Hayes talks about a lot, which is this belief that usually prevails in wealthier societies that a woman's job is to take care of her kid by herself, do the heavy lifting. Maybe she has a nanny, maybe she doesn't. But because of this belief, a lot of these women decided not to work. And what happened then is they faced this conundrum of power imbalances in their marriages. And I think that it's surprising to people to consider it, but it's something that women all over the world, if you look at the worldwide ethnographic data, face, that if you don't work, you have power imbalances in your marriage. So in a way, this society is no exception to the case worldwide. And so we're, we're not considering working at home work? We've gone back to that? I think that working at home is a lot of work. And uh -huh. it's important work, but it's culturally denigrated work. Right. Just like charity work. So I found that these women um, did work. I talk about mommy-nomics, which is this circuit of volunteering for the child's school, volunteering for charities, doing all these things to sort of better the position of the couple socially and to better your children's educational futures. I call that mommy-nomics. Uh -huh. And it is important work. Charity work is really important. Um, but the dark side of it is that, first of all, these women are giving away their skills for free and arguably suppressing the value of female labor. And the other thing uh, that happens is that it's culturally degraded work. So you have these women who are not earning an income and are doing work that basically people don't respect. I mean, you and I both know that we live in a culture where everyone says, how great that you're a mother, that's the world's toughest job, that's the world's most important job. And then you tell somebody at a dinner party, I'm a full-time mother, and they just turn away from you and the conversation ends because it's not something that we respect. But these are educated women. They are. That, that's the part that's, that's, that kills you. Yes. And, and they have more to say at a dinner party than the fact that they're a mother. Yes, they, they're, educated they're women. very educated the women. Paper. They're very educated women, and I, I don't think it changes the fact that the work that they do is devalued. And I thought going into this that 
there was a choice being made. And I did what I tried to do for a lot of the book. I tried to peel back the social motivations and the social script underneath the behaviors. And what I saw was that a lot of times, and this is again a conundrum that women across the country face, not just wealthy women, but a lot of times women say, well, I'm making the choice to stay home with my children. And then you push a little harder and you say, are these choices or are these false choices? And a lot of times, what appear to be choices in women's lives aren't really choices. Example, you are offered a wonderful job and you have a six-month-old baby and it's your dream job. A woman actually described this to me, more than one woman, and she says, I would like flexible time. And she's told this is a full-time job. She says, could I work part-time? No, you cannot. May I do part of my work days from home to spend more time with my child? No, you may not. And then the woman might say, well, then I chose to stay home with my child. How much of a choice is that really? So these are some of the surprising realities of these women's lives when we get beyond the gossip and the misrepresentations of the book that it's just gossipy and I'm throwing people under the bus. None of that is what's going on. There's a little gossip in the book and it is voyeuristic and interesting to look at the lives of wealthy women. What's the point? What is the point you wanted to make? What do you want us to learn from it, take away from it. I think that motherhood is complicated and varies a lot from ecological niche to ecological niche and depending on environmental circumstances. When you're a social researcher, you do your work where you land and you don't make judgments. So when I landed here, it wasn't for me to say, these women's lives are less interesting, less worthy of study, who cares? I really am interested in my whole career in the lives of women and children. So this is one culture that I landed in, and I think that if we peel back what's going on behind the behaviors that we find strange, we're able to make a contribution to the literature of motherhood, understand that women's lives vary from context to context, and understand how to support mothers and children better. Well, I, I thought you had kind of a, a judgment in the book. I thought you were saying, I mean, I certainly felt it, that you were saying, these women are taking this. These women are, are, are giving up the best years of their lives. They've given up you know, their education. They're not using their education. And they're at the service, and, and it's being sort of signaled to them that they're an employee of this marriage. And they will get a bonus if they perform well, if their child gets into the right school, if the dinner parties are all lined up the way they should be, if the houses are kept in order, one woman said, I don't buy my clothes until my, I get my year end. Mm -hmm. I had to go lie down after I read that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was really like, what? You yeah, know, so. If my husband tried that with me, <laughs> that wouldn't he go over well. Out of the sidewalk. That wouldn't go over <laughs> well. Well, your husband wouldn't get to try that with you because you work. Uh, this is from Karen. Does the behavior of these women embarrass you? I have three girls, and I would never, never, never want this type of lifestyle to be the one that they mimic. Well, let's be clear. These women's lives, like the lives of women everywhere, are varied. There is a lot <coughs> that varies from situation to situation <coughs> and person to person. So there were many women on the Upper East Side who taught me very important lessons. One of them was charity. Uh -huh. Even if this is culturally denigrated work, <coughs> this is the right thing to do if you have money. I think that's a great lesson to teach your well, children. Well, I work in philanthropy all my life yeah. with St. Jude. Uh, Brenda has an interesting question. I'm just curious, she says, how long do these types of marriages last? Now, you, I'll bet you've got some insight on that. Which types of marriages? These types of marriages where the woman is the employee of the husband. Well, that's not the only type of marriage that I saw, definitely. Well, I let's saw talk about those. different kinds. Okay, well, let's talk about those. Yeah, marriages where women are economically dependent. Well, as you said, you know, in the 50s, before really the big second wave of feminism, um, women stayed in marriages that they weren't happy with for a long time, for a lifetime. Right. Um, but that's before yeah. Ms. Magazine yes. and, and a lot of laws were changed. And, yes. And getting closer to I mean, having, you know, Arianna Huffington and... Right. And Melissa Meyer. And, and what we're Hillary seeing Clinton. is that inroads aren't made everywhere. Right. And maybe, weirdly, one of the places where inroads right. are not made is the marriages of the 0.1%. Now, many of these women are highly educated and have careers and have economic uh, independence or have negotiated a good deal for themselves with their husbands. But in some cases, 
I saw retrograde arrangements. And it will be interesting to see um, <coughs> what happens in these marriages long term. I was spending time with women who were mothers of very young children. And then I guess you wait and see, um, as is the case you know, across the country a lot of people tend to stay together when the children are younger and you have to wait and see what happens. And Carol wants to know if these women seemed uncomfortable with their situation. With their lives? Yes. Well, I would say that as you and I discussed, that's a great question, and I would say that y there was stress and anxiety that I had not expected to see. I thought if you could you know, have your choice of the very best, most expensive nanny and a private plane and uh, the best massage therapist and the best occupational therapist for your child, I thought you wouldn't be stressed and anxious. But the script of intensive motherhood, which holds that you are responsible for giving your child a perfect childhood, which was not how it was when you and I were growing up for our mothers, that script of intensive motherhood creates stress and anxiety. So some of these women seemed stressed and anxious the sociologist Sharon Hayes coined this term intensive motherhood and what she saw was that in privileged societies where there was a fair amount of money mothers became not just mommies but they became also tutors they became occupational therapists they became playdate companions they became educators they became life enhancers so whereas some woman might be able to say to her kid you sit down and play with the legos the script of intensive motherhood which just prevails in a lot of wealthy cultures holds that when your child sits down to play with legos you sit down to play with your child with the legos too and you make sure that it's the most enhanced educational wonderful yeah, lego experience it can be to do that. they do and yet they feel compelled to do it themselves mm -hmm. like a lot of ideology about motherhood and being female it's received and it's all around us in the culture mm -hmm. and there's a name for it intensive motherhood and boy did i see a lot of intensive motherhood on the upper east side hi benny wants to know is what is the allure uh, for these women is it the money is that being safe is that the allure? what is the allure for the readers who want to read about them no, 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 or no. what is the allure for the woman who gets puts herself into this position in life is it that now I will be taken care of I don't have to go out and work in the jungle this millionaires I think person. that yeah well some of the women that I spent time with had never entered uh, the workforce or some of them had started to and mm -hmm. then um, married men who were making larger incomes than they were mm -hmm. and like women all across the country uh, decided mm -hmm. um, even though there was no really great daycare on site where <coughs> they worked and so it wasn't really a decision right. um, they made the choice choice in quotation marks <laughs> to stay home and um, I think that you can see how it's alluring. You think to yourself, as our mothers thought, or, or you know, many women have thought uh, across the generations. He'll be a good provider. I'll stay home and he'll be a good provider. And then you start living the reality of economic dependency, of not providing for yourself. And with some women it was a better fit, and for some women it was not a good feeling at all. Mm -hmm. Jane wants to know, of all the women you wrote about in the Poor Little Rich Girl article, well, by the way, there's also a wonderful book called The Primates of Park Avenue, which <laughs> I highly recommend. It's fascinating. Who was the one that she wants to know? Which of the women that you uh, met and wrote about stuck with you the most? One woman who really stayed with me was um, a woman who I talked to about sex segregation. You know, I talk in the book about how men and women spend a lot of time apart. and even when we're socializing <coughs> sometimes, then women might be in one room at a dinner party and the men might be in another oh, room I entirely. Oh, I couldn't believe that. Yes, and you know, I looked at, the, in, in my article. You didn't mean during dinner, did you? you yes, I meant after. during dinner. Wow. During dinner sometimes, which was a very, th that was also a, an arrangement that prevailed in the Victorian era, mm -hmm. that kind of sex segregation. And it prevails worldwide in, in many different cultures. And usually what we see is that where there's sex segregation, the status of women is lower. That's what the ethnographic data tells us. Anyway, one woman in particular I spoke to about this, and I would say the women were kind of divided into thirds when I talked to them about sex segregation. I wasn't used to it at all. Why right. were we right. not, not flirting or not sitting <laughs> together? 
So about a third of the women I asked about it just hadn't really noticed it. They were deeply comfortable with it and it made sense to them. A third of the women said, you're right, this is kind of uh, interesting. <laughs> and then a third of the women said, yeah, this actually, this is really weird. So one of the women who really stays with me was a woman who said, yeah, this is really weird. And we had a lot of conversations about it and became very friendly over this topic. And she was kind of a person who, like many of the women who talked to me, all of whom I went to great lengths to protect. And I also went to great lengths to protect the women who didn't want to talk to me. Uh -huh. um, but all, you know, this woman, like so many of the women, was a woman who had a great sense of the strangeness and inter interestingness of the culture as she lived in it. And that's a rare person who can be living in their culture and find it strange and unique and that there are issues worth addressing in it at the same time. Um, Robin says, as a working mother and as a mom, isn't it more important to be a good role model for younger children uh, and working women, working women and, and her children? Uh, that's uh, something in that question is, uh, is, is important, which is, what are these children learning? You know, in, in the women's movement, we always say, girls are watching, what are they yeah. seeing? Girls are watching, what, what are, are they, they seeing? seeing? So these girls are, and these boys are watching, what are they seeing? I think a lot of these girls, what they're seeing is what I saw, a lot of intersexual competition, competition between women uh, to do the best for their children. That's your primate part, to, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, to live in a body display culture. I found that the Upper East Side was a relentless body display culture. There was so much pressure on women, even maybe almost as much as in Hollywood, to look good, to look young, to look fantastic every second, even when you're pregnant, even when you're delivering the baby. So I think that one of the things that girls are learning, um, except in the instances when their moms are taking a minute to point it out to them. But one of the things that girls may be learning in the society is they're learning to be competitive with other girls in ways that are under the radar rather than in sports. Um, they're learning that they're under tremendous pressure to look good all the time. And in cases where their mothers aren't uh, working, they might be learning that economic dependency is you know, a part of women's lives, right. rather than learning but other lessons. But you're talking about this section of, of women, those, these girls that are watching these women. The women yeah, yes. Yeah. So, this is one of the things that's happening for some of the children of the 0.1% right. whose parents have these really, you know, traditional sort of, to us, right. pre-feminist seeming arrangements. My <laughs> question is, have you, is anybody changing their life because they saw themselves now in your book. No one has reached out. Actually, one woman did reach out to me okay. now that we're talking about it. Not too long ago, a woman reached out to me and said, I'm actually um, more focused now on going back to work because of what I read. But you know, that won't be the right choice for every woman. No, Some no, women I'm, are going to fight I'm not for it. Sure, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm not right. saying what the I choice should I be. Just yeah. what, that, you know, when you read about yourself, you say, oh my God. You know, do, does, it, does it impact you? Do you say, oh, well, I, I do that and I'm proud? Or do you read it and say, woo, I'm off the track? I think there's yeah. going to be a range. I think some women might be satisfied with these arrangements and stick to them mm -hmm. and be very mad at me uh -huh. and you for talking about it, mm -hmm. just the way people were mad uh, during the second wave of feminism uh -huh. that we wanted to push at things. Right. And some, and some women um, will want to make a change and some won't. Well, it's fascinating. I wish you a lot of luck with your Thank book. Thank you, Marlo. I and, appreciate uh, it. All righty. Yeah, we look forward to uh, seeing you next time. Thanks so much for being here.